There are only four kinds of people in this world. Those who have been caregivers, those who currently are caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. Join us for Life Journeys, Solutions for Caregivers. Major funding for this program is provided by the John R. O'Shai Foundation, a catalyst for change. Produced in partnership with the American Red Cross Greater Buffalo Chapter. Dedicated to helping people lead safe and healthy lives. Today, many of us struggle to take better care of our elderly and most ill. I was in denial for a long time. And I didn't want to believe that she had dementia. As a caregiver, you need to know how to do things like manage medication, communicate with your loved one's health care team, understand all the options that are available to you, and still take care of yourself. So, have you been sleeping OK? Hey, Russell. I could easily make it a full-time job of taking care of them and taking care of all the business that, that goes along with it. The reward is knowing that I'm succeeding in spite of all I'm up against. I'm Susan Hunt, and in the years that I cared for my mom, I suffered the stress, guilt, and loneliness that most caregivers feel, but I also learned so much. Every year, more than 50 million American families cope with the challenges of caregiving. In this program, we'll talk about being a good advocate for your loved one and learn about a variety of caregiving options available to you. I'm joined by Dr. Robert Stahl and Cheryl and Tricia. And today, we're going to explore a wide range of caregiving options, including assistance in the home, respite, or a higher level of care. And we're also going to talk about effective communication with your loved one's health care team. It's very, very important. Now, Dr. Stahl, you specialize in geriatrics. That's correct. Which basically means you take care of the elderly. That's correct. Older adults. I Older like adults. Okay, That's fair right. enough. The caregiver is so important in this journey. Absolutely. Uh, the caregiver is the eyes and ears uh, for me often, uh, able to bring in information that uh, I wouldn't have otherwise to help uh, my patient, the older adult. Um, I have patients that come in and tell me, no, I haven't had a problem with incontinence, and no, my medications are fine, I take them all the time, and the caregiver's in the background saying, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was in denial for a long time, so she and I didn't want to believe that she had dementia, that there was anything failing. Mother, this way we're going out. We're going out to the car to go to the doctor. Since we switched to Dr. Garbarino, who is a geriatric specialist, I've been coming every visit. Mrs. Braithwaite, are you taking any medication? Nothing I can think of. I must be taking something, but I, I don't know. I think I've prescribed some medicine for you in the past. I'm just going to check with your daughter to see if she knows what I'm talking about, okay? It's not uncommon for a patient to come in the room and tell us everything's all right. They're taking all their medicines. Are you taking this? Yes, yes, yes. And then you'll get a different, completely different picture from the family member. She puts them in her cheek. Uh huh. And then I find them in her room, in the drawer, in socks. You know, how can your physician give appropriate care if he's not getting the right information? But you're paying attention. I'm absolutely. I, I consider them both part of the larger healthcare team. Not just the object, but part. And we need to work together to uh, come up with uh, some ideas on how to maximize everyone's uh, enjoyment of life. Mm -hmm. And I noticed Cheryl over here nodding away because you are a caregiver to your mom. Yes, I am. How did that all come about? My mom has had a total of three strokes. Three strokes? And I have cared for her for the past five years. Mm -hmm. The last oh, one was very okay. severe. She had total paralysis on her left side. Oh, all right. There. Thank you. You're welcome. So this was very new for me. Uh -huh. But I, I guess where I was going with this is, your relationship now with your doctor is good. The communication is solid. We have an awesome relationship oh. with the doctor. My mom, myself, and the doctor, the three of us, is really just like a family. And he listens to me, and I listen to him. You know, I am her mouthpiece and her eyes and ears, and the doctor pays attention when I say things. So, Dr. Stahl, you'd mentioned the word team, and I think, Tricia, you're a very important part of the team because you serve as a discharge planner or a care planner, if you will. Talk to me a little bit about that role. 
Yes, my role is as actually as a case manager. I'm an advocate for the patient and the caregiver. I'm there to be the one to try to find the best resources possible for the patient and caregiver. So I need to have a good rapport mm -hmm. to know what's best for them and what I can do to set up the best services they will need when mm -hmm. they go home or wherever they happen to be going. Mm -hmm advocate and of course the team is is much bigger than just having a discharge planner and a geriatrician or a primary physician it can include specialists right. pharmacists uh, uh, social workers yeah. rehab people in-home care it goes on and on doesn't mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. yes. yes it does yes. Dr. Stahl, talk to me a little bit about the, the you know the education for the caregiver if you will what do people need to know education is key yeah, and uh, for the simple reason that when people understand what's going on, it's a lot easier to deal with it. Uh, it's the uncertainty, uh, not knowing what the diagnosis is, what the medications are for, why other things are being done or happening, that causes a, a lot of distress. So education of both the patient and, and the caregiver are critical. You know, let me touch on one other thing. When you talk about education, because having gone through the process, there were things that were thrown at me that I really didn't understand. And I can remember my mom had what they told me was a mini stroke. They called it a TIA. Jargon's uh, a big problem. And, uh, but something like a TIA, for example, that's a transient ischemic attack. Mm -hmm. Basically transient, lasts a short period of time, ischemic, no blood flowing, an attack, something that happens suddenly. And it's not really a mini stroke. A mini stroke would be something that caused permanent damage to the brain. Mm -hmm. Transient ischemic attacks are something that come and they go away. Mm -hmm. They can be, and they are strong predictors mm -hmm. of future possible strokes, so they have to be uh, uh, taken notice mm -hmm, of. Mm -hmm. But uh, in, in and of themselves, they are not strokes. Well, you, go ahead, you were going to say. I was just going to say that sometimes, though, um, other healthcare professionals do fall into using jargon. So uh, patients and caregivers should feel comfortable to ask what it means. That's right. Because, we, and we have to know that we have to make, make the words uh, clearly understandable for the patient and their caregiver. Exactly. And, you know, you, we're talking about understanding jargon, but another area that I think can be terribly confusing is medication yes. management. Yes. Because, once again, oftentimes if a loved one is a little bit confused, Maybe they just came out of the hospital. They're right. tired. They're not. You know, you really have to understand interactions. And right. I know Cheryl, you went through this, didn't you, with um, your mom? Yes, I did. So I had to learn everything. I had to learn about her medications, what they were for, how often the scheduling for them. Did you ever have any problems with medication? I think sometimes I had one problem with medication after the third stroke. She was put on an antidepressant, and because. She was a little depressed, you could tell it, but when I came in the room um, one afternoon, I noticed that she was not herself, mm -hmm. and I immediately called for the doctor. He returned the call, and I asked, had she been put on anything new? And he did tell me he put her on an antidepressant uh, so to help her mood swing. And I asked him, please take her off. Mm -hmm. And we talked about it. He did ask me why. I told him why, and he said, okay, well, if that's what you think, then we'll take her off and see how she does. What I love is the fact that he actually listened. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Uh, because I've been through situations where they don't listen and they say, I know what's best. Right. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, I think when it comes down to the nitty gritty, it is the caregiver that knows yes. that person inside and out right. and will pick up subtleties in the change of personality uh, in, in many ways. Don't you think, Dr. Stahl? Well, Cheryl, you acted beautifully. Uh, I'd be happy to take you on as uh, my assistant <laughs> because. <laughs> Uh, the first key principle of geriatrics is that sudden change comes from sudden problems, that people don't develop Alzheimer's overnight, right. and uh, a sudden change that you noticed in your mom mm -hmm. was from a sudden problem, this being a, a new medication a being medication, prescribed. Yes. And you were able to pin it down to that and bring that information to uh, the primary care doctor. Yes. Yes. And what I'm taking away from this is one of the most yeah. important things you can do is yeah. to become educated. All right, what is my 100 over 70? You know, she has always been fiercely independent. Mm -hmm. and, and that independence, I think, has enabled her to do this well and, and to come back from hospitalizations. Mm -hmm. And I think that when we look at our options as far as to, to make her take her medicines versus a, a couple of missed dosages, we have to look at the benefit. It's really just trying to weigh quality of life versus benefit of, of, of forcing her to take her medicines, and I think we err on quality of life.
Patricia, you're a case manager, and I would ask you, how realistic is it for somebody to take care of a loved one 24-7, 365 in their home? It's unrealistic. I have a feeling. <laughs> um, it's difficult for anybody who takes on that role. They're going to need a break, but it's difficult for people to make that choice because they may have obligations of work, um, family members of their own they have to take care of, their own family. Um, they might have health problems themselves. So taking on that is very unrealistic. And, and it's your job to sit with them and, and sort of go through everything and point yes. that out, isn't it? Yes. It's important so that I would point out all the options that that caregiver and the patient has available to them now, so that they can choose what they need to do. Now, having said that, you're doing it 24-7. Cheryl, how do you make it work? Well, when my mom had her third stroke and she had full paralysis on the left side, one day in the hospital, a lady came in and introduced herself as a case manager. I couldn't imagine what she was coming for, but as it turned out, she was able to give me some options. She asked me what were my plans and where did I plan to place my mother, and I told her she had to come home. So she said, are you prepared to care for her? I said, yes, I will do whatever is needed. And she said, do you work? And I said, yes. Yeah. She said, well, who's going to take care of her while you're at work? And then she said, let me give you some options. And one of those options that she gave me was the adult daycare, which I had never heard of before. But as she talked about it, I decided I would give it a try. I went to visit. I liked what I saw. I went back home, talked it over with my family, then went to the hospital and talked it over with my mom and asked her to go and give it a try. I'm pretty flexible today. That's good. I've been working them. Good, I can tell. <laughs> I have a chronically ill population. Most of them are frail, elderly. Loosening up a little bit? Yes, very mad. Oh. Ours is a medical adult day program, and so basically what we're doing is we're providing all the services that you would find in a nursing home. We have nursing care, we have certified nursing assistants, occupational therapy, physical therapy. I'm just going to tie Evelyn up here so she can work on her leg muscles. All of this is to keep people out of nursing homes and as independent as possible in their homes. Clara, okay. gravy. We also provide a caregiver respite as a, as a side, really, to our program. We will do uh, trivia, we do games. Here we go, your first number is N42. I think medical day programs are probably one of the best kept secrets in the area. And now we're going to walk. Just step in place. Come here, teach. Because even a lot of the doctors are not aware of our services. Can I have your paw? Your paw. So we do our best to educate them as to what we can do here. Okay, can I do your arm now? Right now she receives physical therapy, occupational, and speech therapy. Really? Yes, and she gets socialization skills there too. Which is so, so important, Dr. Stahl, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. After a stroke, someone needs to uh, get back uh, to where they were as best as possible. So, but I'm saying is it's not just physical, it is mental too, isn't it? And being able to, to be around people. Mm -hmm. Well, Cheryl mentioned the socialization skills, uh, the companionship, mm -hmm. getting out in, a, in real society and interacting with people. That's equally important to the physical recovery from a stroke. Yeah. And you know, Cheryl, when we were talking about adult daycare, I, I have to ask you, that only takes care of a certain number of hours in the day. Do you have people that fill in? Yes. Your daughter? Or? I have my, my daughter, my son, and my aunt. They do help me when needed. But also, every day, every morning, I have an aide that comes in for two hours who gets my mom out of bed. She bathes her, dresses her, and feeds her, and then gets her prepared to catch the wheelchair van so that she can go to the adult daycare. This is a very important issue, I think, which is trust. Yes. And I have to ask you, how did you learn to trust people that didn't know your mom? It was hard, but I, I was very watchful. I am my mom's eyes, and I am her ears, so I watch everything. I will hear something in her room from my room, and I come out and I speak on it. Mm -hmm. But when I needed an aid in the afternoon, there was a challenge that I had, uh, that I needed someone to be in my house when my mom arrived. I reached out to my church administrator and I asked her and I told her what my situation was. I said, I need somebody and I need them now. Mm -hmm. And we were able, we were fortunate enough to find one of the church members who will come in every day mm -hmm. and let my mom in and care for her and do just the reversal. Right. I promise you, be, before I bake anybody else, anything else this week, yours gonna be first. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay. 
she comes in and she gets her dress for bed feeds her dinner talk with her the companion and then she leaves you know cheryl you talked about adult daycare and the health benefits but there are other benefits as well, aren't there, Dr. Stahl? Absolutely. There, there's different types of, of daycare, and there's social daycare where you get companionship, uh, where you get to socialize with people. We provide services to seniors who have dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, it's a program that is meant to um, give caregivers a respite and feel that they really don't have other options. Through the light, with the light from above. They enjoy singing, many of the things that, you know, we all love to do. And, and whatever they want to do here, you know, we try and incorporate that into our day here. So I've got some shapes that I'd like for you to use as stencils. We've we have an art therapist that you'll see here. I found these and they're just so interesting in themselves. This is kind of like a keyhole shape who is very creative in getting them to have a different look at the arts and crafts. Can you trace this one? It's a safe haven to go to right. and you're not alone. You're with others uh, beyond your caregiver which uh, mm -hmm. tends to be somewhat of a, an isolating situation in and of itself. And, and I, we're talking about adult daycare but there are other options out yes. there as well. You talk about home care, respite care. Now there's a word, you know, a lot of people may not know what respite really means. Well, respite, uh, I like to think of it as taking a rest despite everything else that's going on. Good sense. I think it's a great way to remember it. And, and it's so critical for the caregiver to take this respite from a very difficult job of being a caregiver. And it's uh, revitalizing. Yes. Uh, you mm -hmm. come back with a whole new outlook usually. And yeah, but getting to somebody to, to, to really do that, that's another ball. That, have you ever done is. that? Yes, I have. You have? Oh, yes, I have. Okay, I'm proud of you. Yes. we Caregivers are faced with challenges. Um, this is a sacrificial job. And if you're not ready to take the sacrifice, then maybe you need to look at other options. Mm -hmm. But in my case, I have a wonderful daughter and son and an aunt who will assist me in whatever is needed to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, the aides will assist me however needed. But yes, my mom told me, that I needed to go on vacation. And, and I you went listened. To the cruise. Oh, yes, I went. You took a cruise? <laughs> yes. Good for you. Yeah, I can so. see it. I noticed a smile on your face. So yes. It must have done something. And I take many vacations, maybe three days at the most. That's great. You know, Tricia, there's another one. We talk about companionship. Yes. That's very important, isn't it? Yes, there's actually a companionship services out there mm -hmm. that can come into the home to provide the caregiver with time to get out and do what they need to take care mm -hmm. of. And they're with their loved one, and they can help within the household. They can help with meal preparation. They help with house cleaning or just being there with the patient. Also, something as simple as emergency response. Yes. I mean, we used it for our mother, and, and it worked, yes. which, you know, basically is something you wear around your mm -hmm. neck. and mm -hmm. should you fall or need right. help, you just press a button and boom, yeah, right? Yes. Exactly. And then there's assisted living. I mean, there are all sorts of living options, and they're yeah. confusing, aren't they? Yeah. It's important to know that you do have options, and that there's a variety of options available to you, and you should go out and see them. It's but, if, but even with assisted living, there are different levels of assisted living, aren't there? And, and there's not, different types, I would say. There's, there's different, different types, types and, and even if a facility is uh, defined as an assisted living facility, there, there's usually a range of things that one assisted living facility can provide right. compared right. To, to another. another. Mm -hmm. right. So you need to investigate that, research that, yes. go to the place. You need to go to see them. Right. It's important to get out there and see what's available in your community. Uh -huh. And of course, mm -hmm. we haven't touched on nursing homes. Right. And there certainly are a, a variety of nursing homes out there. And I think you have to understand when you need to take a look at that option and then what you should be looking for in a nursing home. I don't know what we do without you. Oh, you'll find somebody else. I doubt <laughs> it. Never you'll happen. You'll find somebody else. Never. We've been happy with yeah. our decision, and, and it is a difficult family decision. It's not easy. It was. We all had equal share in the decision, mm -hmm. you know, for Mom's placement. It was a tough one, but uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, it, 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 it had come to pass. It was that time. It's a beautiful facility, and we thought that Mom would, you know, do well here, too. Uh, we, we liked what we saw, and uh, we said, well, let's, let's give it a try. So mm -hmm. the caregiving really hasn't ended yet. It just shifted. I love you. <laughs> Is that a take? <laughs> you know, see, she was looking at when she was singing, I'm in love with you. <laughs> Her son in law. <laughs>
Dr. Stahl, as we go along the journey of caregiving, you know, and you have a plan in place, it often changes. And uh, I think that as a caregiver, you have to be flexible and understand when that, that plan has to be modified. What are some signs that a caregiver should be looking for? Signs uh, can come from the loved one, your loved one, or they can come from yourself. Uh, from your loved one, a change in medical condition, perhaps a progression of a chronic progressive disease like Alzheimer's disease, uh, a sudden change uh, in something like heart disease where uh, shortness of breath develops. Uh, that can change your plans. But it doesn't mean that all hope is lost either. Uh, you contact the appropriate people when the change occurs and learn how to uh, approach that change and see if something can be done. And many things can be done. For example, incontinence. Often incontinence or falls are the make or break factor between someone staying at home and having to go to a facility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But incontinence is not part of normal aging. So even if incontinence develops, there are ways to investigate causes and treat them. But what I'm getting from everyone is, number one, there are options yeah. yes, there to is. stay in the home, yes. right. or if you can't and you have to move elsewhere, right. there are other options yes. there as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Education, yes. right. understanding, and preparation. So that if you okay. know, for example, Cheryl, I'll just ask you, I know you want to take care of your mom in okay. her home, yes. but if something changes, are you prepared to go to that next level of care or not? Well, I would have to, because her welfare is first. That's first. I'm glad you said that because that's very important. Mm -hmm. We tend to get so caught up that we forget that it's not about just us. That's right. It's right. about the person you're so caring for. It's the one that we're mm -hmm. caring for. That's true. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as you go along the journey, you find out that oftentimes there's sort of, you get tired, you get stressed out. And I, for lack of a better term, it's called caregiver burnout. What are some signs that you're pretty much burned out? There, there is tremendous stress in caregiving. Um, it's a hard job. And when I see a caregiver and a loved one in the office, things that tip me off, yeah, the caregiver looks tired. Mm -hmm. They might be depressed. You could see it on their face. Um, and then just general stress, irritability. Uh, you could see it in the interaction of, of the loved one with the caregiver. Will you take that person aside, that caregiver, and say, hey, no, I, let's talk a little bit. Will you do that? Well, I consider the caregiver my patient also in that kind of situation. And in my problem list that I keep for the older adult, my patient, I put down caregiver stress. Because if I don't deal with that, then my patient isn't going to get the care that they need. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Have you ever experienced caregiver burnout? Yes, I have. <laughs> when my mom told me to go on vacation, I did. When you took that cruise. That's right. I may go to a movie. I may go out for dinner with a friend. I like to go to, for a massage mm -hmm. at a spa. Mm -hmm. So there are things that I do. When I feel the stress coming on, I know now that I need to do something. You know, Cheryl, when I was going through this, I had so many people say, you need to get away. That was number one, which I wouldn't do. I said, well, I can't leave. I have to be there. And the second one was, why don't you go and find a support group? And I didn't really think any existed. And now I'm finding out that there are, are a number of support groups out there, aren't there? Yes. And support groups are very valuable for the caregiver and for the patient. You know, it's, it allows you to have that opportunity to share with others who are going through the similar experiences yes. that you're going through every day. Well, it's hard to see my mother go through what she goes through. It's, it's putting a lot of stress on her. Mm -hmm. And I'm really concerned for her, but I'm also concerned for my dad. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to have a family mm -hmm. and try to balance everything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard for me to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And I really want to be there for my mother. Mm -hmm. But it's so hard. Mm -hmm. It's the hardest thing you'll ever have to do, mm -hmm. if you have to do it. Mm -hmm. I believe in my heart that our loved ones know, they know, even when it gets frustrating, yeah. I think that they know that we're doing the best that we can. Yeah. You talk about traditional support groups, but there are all sorts of different ways that you can create a support group, aren't there? Oh, Where yes. do you get your support, Cheryl? From my family, uh -huh. my aunt, my son and my daughter, mainly, and then I also branch off to my church, mm -hmm. and they are always there for me. But the one thing that I would tell a caregiver is to not feel guilty. Um, when you need time to yourself, take the time to yourself so that you can give the loved one 
the best attention possible. And let's face facts, you notice it in the doctor's office, mm -hmm. and I bet, Tricia, you would have to be able to speak to this very well, which is when you see that situation happening, you know that the person that's being cared for has got to be feeling that as well. Oh, absolutely. You can see it, uh, as Dr. Stoll said, you can see it in the, the caregiver and in the patient, actually, because there's there's irritation going back and forth. There, It can lead to unhealthy relationship if it's not if there's not that ability to share with somebody. Yeah, basically you're just you're doing your, both of your the people a disservice. Right. Uh, and the yeah. most extreme of the unhealthy situations you're yeah. talking about is mm -hmm. elder abuse. Yes. Right. And the most common situations for elder abuse is in this kind of caregiving scenario. Right. When someone is getting so exhausted that they can't think in the loving, caring way that they want to and know how to. Mm -hmm. And it uh, comes out instead in either physical or verbal um, mm -hmm. abuse, misuse. Well, what we're really saying, though, is all of these things that we're talking about, there is a solution. And the solution is education. We talked about that earlier. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll leave the caregiver with the last word today. What would you say you'd like to leave the audience with? Don't feel guilty to love be um, gentle and patient with your loved one. Thank you all. It's been a great discussion and I've learned an awful lot. You know, as you go through the journey of being a caregiver, one of the most important messages that we can leave you with is that you're not alone. Make every effort to reach out, find support, learn about your options, and above all, take care of yourself. Please take some time to visit thinkbright.org and learn more. I'm Susan Hunt, and I thank you very much for watching. If you see a car shape, you make it more like a car. Or if you see the, uh, the shape of the state, state of Iowa, you just make it into the state of Iowa. I have to be accurate. This is my mom's life I'm dealing with, and she can't do it now, so. I do what I have to do. How did you get here so fast? Because I parked right over there. Okay, study goes. Don't think you can do it it's, alone? It's tough sometimes, but it can be done. It can be done, <laughs> yes, it can. Major funding for this program is provided by the John R. O'Shea Foundation, a catalyst for change.